In episode four, we will explore how Visa founder and CEO Emeritus, D. Hawk, induced Visa International. For those of you who have followed the series to date, you will be familiar with the great obstacles D. had to overcome to get this far after having brought thousands of banks together willingly to form the world's first trillion dollar organization. Under his leadership, this group of people embraced new and unorthodox management systems and even built cutting-edge digital authorization systems under time and ahead of budget. Today, we will explore how D brought different cultures together, overcoming centuries of historic differences to form what would become Visa International. Even the name was a challenge. D Hawk, welcome back to episode four. Thank you. It's great to have you back, Dee, and I thought before we explored how you brought all the international banks together, we'd first talk about some of the unorthodox management and leadership methods that you used in National Bank America itself. Thank you, Aiden. Well, it was a difficult thing because everybody I would hire from the outside would bring all of their industrial age thoughts and I was trying to create a completely different culture. For example, after a board meeting, we called a meeting of all employees immediately after the board meeting to tell them everything about it and what had happened and answer all their questions without exception. All I ever ask of them, I said, to act so that I can have full respect and confidence in you. And I will do my best to act so that you can have the same in me. And therefore, we're not going to have any secrets. You're going to know everything about the corporation without exception. And those meetings were just enormously morale building. Another thing I did is that every management retreat we held on weekends that uh, might bring somebody away from their family, we would invite all spouses and their children to every management retreat at company expense. And therefore, they didn't have to separate this. And we didn't have any stock. So I developed a thrift plan to ensure that all employees would have a year's salary in reserve after five years of service and complete financial independence after 25 years. And that permitted any of them to set aside 6% of their salary. Uh, And if they did, the company would set aside one and a half times that amount or 9%. And therefore, they would have 5% of their salary saved to invest every year. And that led eventually to some secretaries, after 25 or 30 years, retiring with a million to $2 million. Uh, Another thing I did to try to break these people away from their old habits, I set a policy in effect that any manager or supervisor who installed any procedure or rules or regulations would automatically be required to follow them themselves. So if they wanted to put in a time clock, it meant that they had to go on a time block and punch in and out. (laughs) And that simple rule just eliminated 90% of the nonsense. I also had a policy of having a weekly lunch at a very luxurious club in the high-rise building. We had taken space in one floor of the big new Bank of America Hard Tower, and I would have the weekly luncheon, and all of the lowest-paid employees who wanted to attend could put their name on a list. And I'd meet with a dozen or so of them every week. And it allowed the lowest level employees to uh, feel like they had direct access to me, which they did. Another thing we did is create an office of the president composed of senior officers. And any 
person that needed approval at the highest level could go into any one of the senior officers, and the decision they make would be binding just as though they were president. And then, of course, periodically we could share experience with one another. So uh, it's hard to describe all the things we did, but uh, nearly everything was the opposite of what people had been accustomed to and created a very effective organization, largely devoid of all the hierarchical nonsense that goes on. I loved one of the quotes you talked about these meetings that you ran, and you said, my greatest delight from all my days leading Visa were open staff meetings from which you never wavered. Within a day after every board meeting, staff meetings were held to include every employee of the company at every level, including the newest. They were conducted by the most senior person present. At the meeting, every decision of the board was fully disclosed. Every employee was free to ask any question about the decisions or anything else of concern to them. Their questions were answered fully that's confidential, was not considered an answer. I don't know, but I will find out and tell you at the next meeting was permissible, but only if the promise was faithfully kept. I love this kind of open culture that you introduced at such an early stage, Dean. Some companies are starting to do this, but there was one question in particular that you dealt out to the employees, particularly to quash any gossip. And you used to say, what was the juiciest, most titillating rumor circulating the halls and circulating the water cooler, and you'd throw that out to the employees. I'd love if you shared this mindset. That was probably the best part of the meetings because all the employees then would be required to tell me the rumors they'd heard, and then I could give them a direct response whether the rumor had any substance or was just utter nonsense. And that way, the rumor mill in the organization was literally brought to a uh, a halt. And of course, some of the rumors were so preposterous that everybody would get a good laugh out of them. The give and take in those meetings from the brand new employees at its lowest level to the head of the company created a culture that was not only efficient and effective, it was a great deal of fun. So Dee, let's get into the start of the Visa International story. We ended episode three on the brink of this because you'd been asked to lead that charge after having successfully brought thousands of banks together in the USA. And that itself was a challenge, but bringing together multiple cultures. And as we discussed before, all with their own internal models of reality, was itself a major challenge. Of course, the Bank of America had continued to license banks overseas while uh, National Bank of America was in its first three years of operation. And after three years, the banks had formed an international committee, and they were enamored of the success we were having in the U.S., So they attempted to uh, create a similar organization and just failed completely. And of course, I was a part of that. So what happened is they turned to me and asked me if I and my staff could act as organizing agent and uh, attempt to help them uh, form a comparable international organization. And that, of course, required me to go to the NBI board and ask for the same situation that Maxwell Carlson had given me. That is to give me complete freedom with no obligation to National Bank of America Art Incorporated to make the attempt and uh, for me to continue as president of NBI with full salary and benefits, but free to go wherever I wanted to try to create the international. And this immediately caused a lot of fear in the NBI board because they then had 
over half of the total volume of the system. And they were afraid this would require them to give up some autonomy and authority and join as a just one member of a larger organization. And I had to overcome that by reminding them of Mr. Carlson's response when NBI was in the formative stage and the reaction of Sam Stewart when he agreed that B of A would support it and that they were now in that same position. It was their turn to be good citizens. And so I simply asked them if they ever had those principles or were abandoning them. And of course, there was no way to answer that other than to give me the freedom I needed and release me to work on it. The challenges faced in creating the international organization, which we came to call Ibanco, I-B-A-N-C-O, using Latin word banco, nothing like this had ever been attempted in the commercial world. And it was far more complex and complicated than forming NBI. It meant we had to transcend geography, custom, culture, languages, political systems from democracy to dictatorship, differing economic systems from free enterprise to totalitarianism, different legal systems, and even transcend wars that can exist from time to time in more than 150 countries and territories. Now, the situation regarding the trademarks, B of A had licensed National Bank of America with a perpetual license the use of the band's design, blue, white, and gold, and use of the name, at least in the U.S. But I had negotiated a provision in that, that if there ever was possibility to convert to a uniform name worldwide, that the ownership of the bands would automatically transfer to the international license, and the Bank of America name would go back to Bank of America. And at that time, every international bank refused to use the name Bank of America for obvious reasons. So it had a different name. It had the band's design uniform, but it was Chargex in Canada, Sumitomo card, in Japan, Carter Blue in France, Barclay Card in England. So there was no common name. So it was an enormous challenge that we undertook, Aiden. Dee, at this stage, you had built your entire career on a set of principles for you as a person, but also on the original Visa or National Bank America as it was. You had built and let that organization emerge from these principles. Did you maintain those principles now that you went international? Because that would be a huge difficulty to do so, those principles that were so important to you over the early years. The three questions that I was obsessed with and the pursuit of answers never ended during the, the even the most busy times. I have a habit of rising at five in the morning for two hours of thought, study, and writing. And I always, during my life, had two or three books at hand to read on airplanes in every idle moment. So that carried over into my time at NBI. And the very nature of forming them uh, took a great deal of analysis. And one of the things that I pursued is uh, why and where uh, came the universal perpetual urge to receive and transmit information. The incessant desire to communicate was it an urge at all 
or an unavoidable necessity and an integral part component of life itself. And it helps to think what information is not. Information is far more than digits and data. They may be components of it, but they're not it. And certainly information is just not another finite physical entity. And Gregory Bateson, in a rare insight, proposed that information is a difference that makes a difference. If you can perceive something which can't be differentiated, or if it is once differentiated, it makes no difference to you. He asserts it's just noise. And I think that perception is extremely information when you're trying to find out what it might become or ought to be in the what's called the information age. And unlike physical resources, information is not depleted by use. Information is transmitted. When it's transmitted, it's gained to the recipient, but it's no loss to the source. Information can be utilized by everyone without loss to anyone. And as far as we know, the supply of information is infinite. Therefore, it doesn't obey any industrial age concepts of laws of scarcity. Information is a miser of energy. It can endlessly replicate, move ubiquitously at the speed of light, and massively condense in minute minute space, and all at minuscule expense of other energy. In other words, at minute cost. And information breathes. When one bit of information is combined with another, the result is new information. The information knows no boundaries. It can't be contained. And uh, the whole history of modern science has been an effort to divorce, divorce the ethical dimensions of it from the physical the divorce of subjective values from objective observation. In other words, the divorce spirituality from rationality. And the effect has been the deification of the rational, physical, objective content of information as ultimate truth and dismiss, dismiss the subjective, ethical, and spiritual content as superstition or delusion or ignorance. And thinking about a society based on one and when based on physicality requires radically different perspectives and consciousness. We often prefer to carry the fundamental differences from the age of machine crafting into the age of my of machine of mind crafting. So uh, the old concepts such as ownership, finite supply, obsolescence, loss by conveyance, containment, scarcity, separability, and command and control management simply do not apply the information. Therefore, This new age based on information calls into question every concept of societal organization, management, and conduct on which we've come to rely. And uh, clinging to rigorously the old concepts and dismissing new concepts too lightly is just disastrous. And I think Sir Francis Bacon put it precisely when he wrote, they that reverence too much the old times are but a scorn to the new. Also, as we pursued information, and it's critical to forming the international corporation, because that's what we'd be doing is dealing with massive change. 
uh, came to realize that over the past few decades, a quiet inversion has taken place that few people notice. During the industrial age, the value of the physical contents of goods, services was enormous compared to the value of the mental contents. The bending of steel and other meldings, welding, bolting, the process of replication, the smelting, pounding, twisting, and so on, the sheer amount of metal and other material and labor to produce a typewriter, automobile, or other product dwarf the value of design and other metal content. But with the advent of computers and other microelectronic technology, the value of the metal content began to grow in relation to the value of the physical content. The value of the mental content of a microchip is enormously greater than the value of a little bit of silicone which is the physical content. And the value of metal content of a computer or smartphone is enormously greater than the value of the physical content. So over the course of a half century, the inversion has taken place and everything is reversed. The value of the mental content of goods and services is now enormously greater than the value of the mental content. And we have no means of societal organization that will deal with it, but it's certain to be huge. That means that during the next 50 years, an infinite variety of what I call chaotic organizations will have to emerge. And forming Ivanko was uh, was a big step in that direction. Those biases, those mechanistic ways would be difficult enough in one culture. So dealing with those in one culture, such as you did in the US and bringing all those banks together. But we all form our own worldviews based on teachers, parents, culture, education in individual countries. So to bring all those countries together must have been an enormous challenge. Yes, Aiden. It was putting me back almost in the same situation I had when I formed National Bank of America. But this time, transcending all of the things I mentioned before, and it was particularly difficult for me because I'm not multilingual. My only language was uh, English. Therefore, uh, there was constant need of interpreters and the resulting difficulties that created. But as I began working with the International Committee, I started noticing things that I had never really thought of before. One of was the stereotyping of individuals between different nations. When I was meeting with the International Committee as organizing agent, the um, Italian would come to me privately and say, you just can't deal with the British people. They're stubborn. They're so set in their ways. They don't have an open mind. They're just narrow-minded and stubborn. Well, that's a stereotyping. It's not talking about an individual. It's, it's what a great Supreme Court justice called the tyranny of tags and labels. By the same token, Englishmen would come to me and say, you can't deal with these Italians. They're too volatile, too emotional. They just will not listen to reason. Well, uh, not true. And I noticed interesting physical things. To the Latin peoples, especially Italy, they're not comfortable talking to someone until they're face-to-face and extremely close. They like to be right up in your face. It's just culture. And yet uh, English people, England, United States, are not comfortable unless there's a fair amount of space between you and them. So just even physical characteristics had to be resolved. 
Well, I had to get them beyond this idea of stereotyping and thinking that the Orientals are inscrutable and never say directly what they mean. Well, it's a cultural thing. And uh, I started to puzzle over how to do this and ask myself, well, who knows me so well that I have to be my individual self? I can't posture and stereotype others. And it came to me that it was Furl, my wife. So I did something that had been unheard of. I started having meetings of the International Committee and invited all the wives to attend and put pressure on them because I was bringing Furl. Well, they all accept that, some of them grudgingly. And then I would have the meetings begin at 7 in the morning run until one, then have a wonderful lunch with uh, husbands and wives, and the rest of the afternoon for them to associate with one another as, uh, as people, as couples. And it was no time at all until uh, when they were separate, the uh, stereotyping was, was completely broken. Because the women just didn't behave that way. And the husbands were ashamed to behave that way in front of their wives. And uh, so uh, I had to do dozens of things like that uh, just to create the conditions by which uh, an international organization could evolve. In other words, I had to induce behavior and not control it or try to persuade it. Uh, But we had some very serious problems. Uh, Midway into the effort, at one of the meetings, I became very concerned about how some of the members of the organizing committee were behaving. I had the sense that not all of them were really uh, in favor of this, and we're trying to surreptitiously undercut it. And I had one of my key staff officers helping me with the international. So uh, we, we, we tried to figure out how we could deal with this without uh, confronting anyone or accusing them of anything because we weren't entirely sure. So we did something uh, totally unorthodox. There was an international meeting of all licensees overseas that the B of A had called, which was about a month uh, in the future. So we made a decision and announced arbitrarily we had decided to resign as organizing agent. But we didn't say why. We simply said conditions are such that we do not think that it's possible for us to go on and participate. Well, this created a furor just prior to the international meeting. Well, while the international meeting was held, it was, again, of course, conducted by an officer of Bank of America that was uh, assigned to the licensees of banks overseas. And he started the uh, uh, final meeting with uh, uh, very similar to the way the meeting uh, at which I had made a suggestion that, that led me into the formation of NBI. And, uh, so uh, we attended the meeting. The B of A went uh, on with some innocuous uh, uh, agenda they had uh, disturbed. And uh, right in the middle of the meeting, one of the international licensees stood up and said, look, I'm, this is nonsense. I came here to find out why the organization organizing agent resigned 
and why he thinks it can't be formed. And that's what I want to know about. And of course, uh, the meetings started, people started saying, yes, exactly, right on. That's what we want to know. They had no choice to be of A but to call on me as organizing agent because a lot of the people objecting to the agenda were looking at me and addressing their questions more to me than to the B of A officer. So I simply stood up and said, well, uh, we, we, we left this because we don't think everyone uh, is acting in good faith. And uh, under those circumstances, we don't feel that as organizing agent that we can accept it and continue. Uh, but I refuse to make accusations. And whenever anybody said anything, I said, that's all I can tell you. Well, the meeting uh, adjourned early and everyone was talking to everyone else uh, on and on. Uh, Ken Larkin, who is a senior officer over the man conducting the meeting, came to me and asked me what I thought I could do, what he could do. And uh, I said, I thought maybe if you stood up in the meeting in the morning and reiterated your the Bank of America's commitment to this, it would carry a lot of weight. And uh, so uh, international licensees were meeting and talking. Well, we walked in uh, to the meeting the next day, and um, Ken Larkin made his uh, comment. And uh, then the international committee members said, came to me and said uh, that the chairman of the committee was resigning because he had other more things at his bank that he had to involve in. Uh, the Bank of America officer conducting the meeting was uh, 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 silenced because Ken Larkin, who is his superior, had told him he would run the meeting from now on. And uh, the committee then came to us and asked us if we would resume our our chairmanship and our, our uh, function as organizing agent and assured me that uh, several members of the committee had also resigned um, and it had been reconstituted with a new chairman and they could assure me that all members of the committee would be acting in good faith. So we, of course, agreed that that is what we would do. And as we uh, moved ahead to form Ibanco, there were constant problems to overcome, but there was a final problem we just couldn't overcome. There are two or three of the international banks and members of the international committee that were holding out for some things that the rest of the committee did not think were right, nor did I. And we had arrived at an impasse. And we decided that we were having a final meeting to decide whether to continue the effort or abandon it. And um, we're meeting in California at, at San Francisco. And I was obsessed with how and worried about what I could do to reduce the kind of behavior that would enable everybody to move ahead. And so we came up with the idea of employing a jeweler to design sets of cufflinks, which could be cast in gold. And it was at a time when everybody wore French cuff shirts and cufflinks were very uh, popular. And on one cufflink, cufflink in uh, raised gold would be an outline of half of the world. 
and around it, we would have a place for some language. And I had thought deep and hard as I could of what had enabled us to get as far as we had and came up with the idea that it had really been two things, having the will to succeed and having the grace to compromise. And I knew that we couldn't put that on the golden cufflinks because it would destroy what we were trying to do if it was any particular language. So I went to a Latin scholar and had them translate that into Latin. And it came out as studium ad prosperendum voluntas inconveniendum. So half of the world on one Gulf cufflink had the will to succeed in Latin around it. And the other half of the world on the other cufflink had the grace to compromise. We met in the meeting and the first day we we just couldn't get resolved. No matter how hard we tried, the two or three dissidents just didn't feel they could come unless they got some special procedures and the rest didn't think that was the right thing to do. And I was obsessed with getting all of them again. So we had planned a dinner that evening and a beautiful boat trip across the bay in San Francisco with the sun setting behind the Golden Gate Bridge. Went to a small hotel and restaurant in Los Sausalito, the same one where the committee of four that broke loose the principles on forming National Bank of America had gone when they were uh, facing a difficult decision. So we had a wonderful dinner and some wine. And then after dinner, uh, a beautiful little package was set in front of everybody at the table. And I got up and explained that the organizing agent, uh, we had felt that we needed to give everybody a gift for all the work they had put into it. But we didn't know whether it was going to go ahead or or the effort would die. And so we we were desperate to find a gift that could go uh, either way. It would be something they could remember if they failed or remember if they succeeded. So then I said, would you all open the package? And they opened it and got out the cufflinks. And then I explained that what they were reading around the outer circle of the half worlds was Latin for the will to succeed and the grace to compromise. And I said, I I would appreciate it if you would all wear these to the meeting tomorrow morning, because if we disband the effort, it will remind you forever that you lack the will to succeed and the grace to compromise. (laughs) But if by some miracle we decide to go ahead, then it will remind you the rest of your life that the world was united because every one of you had the will to succeed and the grace to compromise. And then uh, one of the dissident members, a good friend of mine, rose up in the middle of it and said, you miserable bastard. (laughs) (laughs) And of course, the whole group dissolved into laughter and we adjourned and went home. The next morning at the meeting, the dissidents came in, said that they had considered everything, were willing to surrender their special demands. And within an hour, the decision was taken to form a banco with every licensee willing to surrender their license and convert to equitable ownership. And NBI surrendered its total autonomy to the new organization. And so Ibanco came into being. 
our competitors were not able to emulate it for some time. So the number of banks increased exponentially with even greater increases in cardholders, merchants, and volume. And Visa International started, what became Visa International, started to just forge way ahead of all its competitors. The question that comes to mind based on your previous experience, so with National Bank AmeriCard, educing that business, emerging that business, letting the order come from the chaos, and staffing it with the right people, the people that were in it for the long term, that becomes so much more complicated. And many people listening to the show will understand that perhaps their founders or CEOs or entrepreneurs, and they'll understand once you try to scale a business, it loses some of its principles and values, etc. So how did you manage? Because to bear in mind, you were both CEO of the National Bank AmeriCard business, essentially, so Visa in the USA, and then the international body. So that became difficult. How did you manage that duality? Once the decision was taken to create it, the immediate question that came out was how it going to be staffed? Would it hire its own staff and start up from scratch? What would our role be? Because as organizing agent, that was finished. The international group immediately raised those questions and then came with a very difficult request. They said, well, you've been successful, you and your staff, in acting as organizing agent and overcoming all these obstacles. Why don't you go on and manage Ibanco as well as NBI. <laughs> well, that created an immediate problem because there would be times when what the international group wanted to do, Ibanco, and what National Bank of America thought was the best thing for them. So anybody that was managing the whole thing would have clear conflicts of interest. And how could they be resolved? Well, uh, you know, the habit of trying to think of unorthodox things raised its head, and I had to sit back and do a, a lot of thinking. I came up with the idea that National Bank AmeriCard and a banco could enter into an agreement which both boards would adopt to allow me and the staff to act as staff for both organizations. And the agreement would specify that if there were conflicts of interest, uh, we as, a, as managing staff would simply notify both boards and then the uh, chairman of the executive committee of the National Bank of America board would uh, represent the interests of uh, that organization. And I would be released with complete freedom to uh, deal with the conflict of interest as representing the total of the international organization, which included National Bank America. <laughs> and uh, we managed to get that drafted in a way that both boards and I, with the staff, could agree to. And so we started a situation where I was CEO of both corporations. I sat on both boards as they met on alternate dates. But when any conflict arose, I represented only a bank hope and not a National Bank of America. Well, having bridged that gap made it uh, much easier to educe the, the 
common behavior in both organizations and build this as a single management staff reporting to different organizations. And it also permitted me to assign certain members staff to work entirely on the international uh, situation and other staff to work entirely on the U.S. part of the question. But the demands on management and on me just increased exponentially. And later, in later episodes, we'll get into how it got even more complicated. One of the things that I had come to think about, Aiden, was the ordeal of change. In everything we did, since we were pioneering new things, created enormous change in thinking and behavior and in organizational structure. And it takes me back again to those three questions. Why are institutions everywhere, whether commercial, political, and social, increasingly unable to manage their affairs? Why are individuals everywhere increasing in conflict with and alienated from the institutions of which they're part? And why are society and the biosphere increasingly in disarray? And the answer cannot be found, I discovered, without understanding compression of time and events. And some of your listeners, if they're nearing my age, can recall the 1950s when a check might take two weeks to find its way through the banking system, and bankers called it float. And today, uh, People are aware of the incredible speed and volatility which money moves in its electronic form and the profound effect it has on us all. But money float has has disappeared. And then I came to realize that we ignore vastly more important compressions of time and events. You can consider life itself. The first life forms appeared approximately four and a half billion years ago. And it took evolution only half that time, 2.2 billion years, to make the first tiny step from the non-nucleated cell to the nucleated cell. And it took only half that time, a billion years, to create the first simple vertebrate then only a half billion years to produce primitive fish and reptiles. Then in only 200 million years, it produced dinosaurs, birds, and complex plants. And then in only 100 million, it produced mammals. And each change reduced by more than half the time required to produce the next exponential leap in the diversity and complexity of organisms. And that's true right on through to the creature that's talking to you now. And there's no reason to believe that in that exponential direction of time to create more diverse organisms will not continue. In fact, with the advent of genetic engineering, the time required for creation of new species may literally collapse into a matter of months. And this same pattern is apparent with respect to information. Uh, It took centuries for information about the smelting of ore that creep across a single continent and bring about the Iron Age. During the time of sailing ships, it took decades for that which became known to become that which was shared. 
when man set foot on the moon, it was known and seen in every corner of the globe 1.4 seconds later. And yet that is hopelessly slow by today's standards. Countless events anywhere can be heard and seen everywhere in microseconds. And even more important is the compression of scientific and technological float. It took centuries for one of the first bits of technology, the wheel, to gain universal acceptance. It took decades for the steam engine, <clears throat> electric light, and automobile. It took years for radio and television. Today, countless microchip devices sweep around the earth like the light of the sun in the universal use almost instantly. And the same is true of culture. For the better part of recorded history, it took centuries for the customs of one culture to material affect another. Today, that which becomes popular in one country can sweep through others within weeks. And language is no exception. Words from one language used to require generations to take root in another. Common words now emerge from the global culture simultaneously in all languages, while English is rapidly becoming a universal tongue. As anyone who's listened to pilots and controllers of aircraft is bound to note, and it's no different with space, Hayden. Within a couple of long lifetimes, we went from the speed of the horse to the speed of interstellar travel. Men and materials now move in minutes, where they used to move in months, while services based on information do so in a fraction of a second. Now, this endless compression of the of time between major changes, whether of life forms, money, information, technology, time, space, or anything else, can be combined and thought of as tremendous acceleration of change. The time between what was and what is going to be, between the past, past and the future. Only a few generations ago, the present stretched relatively unaltered from a distant past into a dim future. Today, the past is ever less predictive, the future ever less predictable, and the present scarcely exists at all. Everything is accelerating change with one incredibly important exception. There has been no compression of institutional change. Although their size and power have vastly increased, although we constantly tinker with their form and change their labels, there has been no new commonly accepted idea of societal organization since the concepts of corporation, nation state, and university emerged with the advent of the Industrial Revolution. The simple fact is that we're attempting to manage the constantly changing, immensely more complex and diverse world of mindcrafting with archaic mechanistic concepts and organization and management uniquely suited to an age which is dying, the industrial age of machine crafting. It's an exercise in futility. It simply will not work. It has created a global epidemic of institutional failure.
<laughs> the, I love what you just talked about there, and I love the concept of the float. It really, really resonated with me, and it made me think of a quote from the book that I thought would be a nice way to finish today's episode, which is, we are at that very point in time when a 400-year-old age is rattling in its deathbed and another is struggling to be born, a shifting of culture, science, society, and institutions enormously greater and swifter than the world has ever experienced before. And as you say, that's happening in everything except organizations. And I look forward to our next episode where we'll explore how you had used Visa International, how you brought all those people together, and how that led to the world's first trillion dollar business. Dee Hawk, thank you very much. Thank you, Aiden.